Welcome to the session on human AI collaboration. So I'm Emily Maurer Provost, an associate professor here in computer science and engineering. And my work focuses on designing algorithms to recognize behavior from natural speech, but we're not here to hear about me. So first up, we have uh, Professor Xu Wang. Her talk is entitled uh, Sourcing Student Open-Ended Solutions to Create Scalable Learning Opportunities. She's an assistant professor in computer science and engineering here at the University of Michigan. And her research is focused on supporting the learning of more people in effective ways. She draws techniques and theories from human computer interaction, learning sciences and artificial intelligence to develop computational methods and systems to support scalable learning and teaching. Specifically, one of her research goals is to empower instructors and educators to create effective learning experiences more easily. She builds teacher support systems and learning at scale systems using human AI collaborative approaches. Without further ado, we look forward to your talk. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to join the AI Symposium today to discuss human AI collaboration. Uh, in my research, I develop uh, methods and tools to support education. I see instructional design as an area where human AI collaborative methods could be impactful. As it requires expertise and planning from the instructors, and at the same time, AI and data could empower instructors in their decision-making process. In this talk, I'll be focusing on one project where we harness students' written solutions and support instructors in creating scalable learning opportunities. Large numbers of people are seeking higher education and professional development. For example, people learn in classrooms, which actually look more like this right now. In addition to physical programs, universities and higher ed companies are opening online programs to accommodate more students. At the same time, companies are also growing professional training programs to better support their employees' career choices. For all of these educational service providers, one challenge to meet the demand is to scale these education opportunities while maintaining or improving their quality. However, sometimes maximizing system scalability and quality are at odds. To illustrate this challenge a bit more, I will give examples. For example, in one-to-one -one tutoring, students may receive individualized feedback. However, this doesn't scale. Another example is uh, for MOOC lecture videos. On the one hand, it makes lectures easily scalable. However, it doesn't provide interactive forms of learning by doing, which was found to produce higher quality learning. And let's look at another example. Uh, as we have all taken uh, so many courses in, our, uh, 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 in all of our trajectories, let's, uh, we know that open-ended assignments or open-ended projects are first are frequently given in college classrooms. They often require lots of efforts on grading and offering feedback from instructors that's hard to scale. On the other hand, we know that multiple choice questions are naturally scalable since they can be automatically graded and provide real-time feedback to students. And then the question uh, becomes how to create multiple choice questions that exercise higher order thinking and achieve the same level of learning as open-ended tasks. In this talk, I will introduce a system upgrade that uses human AI collaborative methods to create high quality multiple choice questions by leveraging existing students' written solutions. I will explain how the technique works in a context of learning heuristic evaluation, which is a usability inspection method in user interface design. I will now take a minute to explain what is heuristic evaluation. In Gmail, after I sent an email, um, immediately I got this interface that says matches sent with an undo button. So this is an example interface that supports the rule of user control and freedom because users have the freedom to undo this action if they accidentally hit the send button. Now let's look at another interface on eBay. On the purchase page, the only option for users is to buy. There are no access for users if they decide to shop more. This is an example interface that violates the rule of user control and freedom. So I hope you get a quick basic understanding of what heuristic evaluation is. And when I'm teaching this topic, an open-ended assignment I would really give students is, uh, may look like this. 
Go find five web design features that violate certain web design heuristics and explain why. And here is an example student solution in response to this assignment question. So you see a screenshot from a PDF file a student submitted. And let's zoom in a little bit. First, there's a web design feature that they found and it's a checkout page on eBay. And then the student would describe this design violates the rule of user control and freedom. And later on, they also explain this violation is because the website didn't offer an emergency exit. You see that this is uh, the assignment that students turn in and these, it has these uh, components. So what our system upgrade does that is that it first uses these previous student uh, submission as input and segment it into these three components, including a web design feature, a rule violation, and explanation for this rule violation. Then our system will restructure these components to produce multiple choice questions. A target multiple choice question produced would be like this. Here's a web design feature. And the question asks, which of the following heuristic rules does this violate? The original student answer is used as, oh, sorry. The original student answer is used as the correct answer and the distractors are selected from the pool of answers offered to similar problems. And additionally, the original student's explanation on why this design violated this rule is used as feedback for this multiple choice question. Okay, so following this example, here is an overview of how, uh, how upgrade works. Upgrade is leveraging the capabilities of both humans and the machine. Past students function as a crowd that offers data source. And we use machines to segment, select, and reorganize these examples. And in this process, we elicit expert feedback on high-level planning. And finally, the expert would validate the questions for quality control. This workflow enables Upgrade to quickly produce good quality multiple choice questions at scale. Now we'll talk about each step in details. Step one almost happens naturally. Past students' written solutions are logged. They can be logged in PDF formats or through online forms. In step two, our system segments the written solutions into components based on the assignment template. In this case, the student work is segmented into these three components. And in step three, we ask the instructor to specify a question creation schema in which the instructor will specify which components in the source will be used in the target question. This step is critical and requires high level planning and knowledge from instructors. In step four, based on the schema, the system reorganizes the source data to create multiple choice questions. One critical step here is to select distractors. And we applied two text processing techniques to select distractors based on the instructor's input. So first of all, we computed word vector similarity between the correct answer and the pool of answers uh, to, uh, yeah, we've, we computed word vector similarity between the correct answer and the pool of answers to select options that are the most similar to the correct one as distractors. And second, in our interviews with instructors, they prefer to use generic answers as uh, than specific answers as distractors to prevent students from getting the question right simply by matching keywords or surface features. And here we used uh, we computed the abstractness score for the options and prioritized the answers that are more abstract as distractors. And in the last step, we ask instructors to select questions from the large question pool. For this one question schema with 100 student solutions in one offering of the course, the system created nearly 500 multiple choice questions. And then uh, now the instructor's job is just to say yes, no, or maybe to these questions and make edits when necessary until they find enough to deliver in the class. We now see that upgrade can produce multiple choice questions at scale, but are the questions produced helpful for learning? Uh, I will uh, talk about 
uh, I will briefly talk about two evaluation studies. So we performed two studies in two college uh, level courses uh, on user, uh, user research methods uh, that are spanning uh, multiple weeks. We basically divide students into uh, groups that use traditional business as usual uh, open-ended assignments or use the upgrade generated assignment. So the findings uh, are here. We found that students learned the same through both conditions. Uh, in, this is the uh, result for study one. The light bar here is upgrade and the dark bar here is the traditional condition where the student did business as usual open-ended assignment. You may see that the trend is slightly favoring the upgrade condition, but the difference isn't significant. On the other hand, we do see a significant time reduction between the two conditions. The average time students spent on their open-ended assignment was 6.5 hours, and when doing upgrade, it's reduced to 4.5 hours. So it suggests that students learn as much with upgrade as traditional open-ended assignments in 30% less time. And in study two, we also found that students' performance on open-ended projects significantly increased after they learned with upgrade. As you can see in the bar in the bar chart here, the lighter bar here is the upgrade condition. We also got feedback from the instructors uh, of the courses afterwards. And here are some uh, feedback mentioned by the instructors. One benefit here is that uh, uh, it's, uh, the instructors found this a method to save a lot of grading efforts, which they liked. And the instructors also suggested using upgrade as a precursor to open-ended uh, tasks. Uh, for example, they expressed concerns around the low quality of open-ended work students turned in and suggest that, that future practice could get students practice with upgrade first and then go off to generate new content. We also got positive feedback from the instructors on the quality of questions produced by upgrade. Uh, for example, instructors said, the instructors they write tend to be uh, obvious and easy. In this approach, they see more plausible distractors. And another instructor said the questions are really good and they want to use in uh, for students in the capstone project. So over the uh, past two years, we've applied upgrade in multiple modules and uh, also uh, involved multiple instructors in the process to see uh, which classes are, which content are more appropriate to use this approach to support uh, quality and a scale, a scalable learning at the same time. And one major takeaway from this process is that the close collaboration between humans and the machine is the key to success. With instructors alone, it is hard for them to generate lots of elaborated good examples and wrong answers. And it also takes a lot of time and efforts from experts. However, with machine alone, traditional automatic question generation techniques uh, with solely AI mainly produce fact questions and are not flexible. In, in our case, past peers offer a powerful data source with structured examples that show common errors. With this better input, machine can auto-select and filter and reorganize examples. In this process, we also see that we also elicit instructor's feedback along the process when instructor is making high-level planning, for example, specifying question creation schema, communicating their needs, uh, for, uh, such as, uh, as in the process, uh, when we talk to instructors, some of them may want similar examples, some of them want technical answers, and these criteria, uh, uh, these needs and criteria guide the machine in reorganizing and selecting examples. And in the end, instructors will also check the information accuracy and comprehensiveness. And this all together, uh, this all together supports the creation of quality learning opportunities for learners. In this process, we also observed scenarios when the technique doesn't work very well, which points to some future directions. In fact, we found that the success of upgrade is associated with the quality of data input. For example, when we have structured examples from students and feedback on these examples, upgrade will produce higher quality content. 
We also suggest future pathways for experts to actually actively collect better examples and design activities so that students are self annotating their own examples. And these examples would serve as a more powerful data input for the process. We also see uh, further processing opportunities using AI. For example, we are creating a layer of building blocks here so that instructors can select which AI module they want to apply in uh, filtering and modifying the examples. Also, we want to support more frequent and seamless communication between the expert and the machine so that experts can communicate their needs and requirements through this, uh, through this frequent and seamless human AI collaboration. And in this process, uh, there are also several questions we want to answer in the future. For example, in this uh, human AI collaboration process, what are the boundaries? Uh, what are tasks that humans are capable of uh, that they want to do themselves? And what are tasks that they are not capable of and they want to, they want to communicate their requirements for the AI to do? And also another question we want to explore is how to minimize the expert effort, where we will both give the expert agency in the process and also use AI to best empower uh, their, uh, in their content creation process. Uh, yes, that, that's all for my talk. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your great talk. That was really interesting. We, ha we have time probably for, for one quick question. And so, um, the question I have for you, I, I think this is so interesting. I love the idea of creating this, this sort of interactive uh, content. And I'm curious how you think about ambiguity in this context. So in domains where there might not be definitive right or wrong answers, how do you think about designing questions that might be able to capture this gray area? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So um, one thing I've, uh, we've been thinking about is uh, there are definitely areas uh, it, like uh, for the courses that we have uh, the, the experiment in mostly on user research methods, and there are methods that are better defined, for example, surveys, uh, interviews, those are uh, those have longer uh, uh, longer uh, history of using them and people are uh, have uh, more guidelines on how to how to use these methods, but there are also uh, there are also content that are uh, less well defined. So we were, I was thinking about the question of when something is ambiguous, it is because it is naturally ambiguous, or it is because we haven't applied it that much so that the domain is uh, not so well defined. Um, actually, one thing I've, uh, we've been see seeing is that for those cases, using this approach, when we are pre presenting these examples for instructors, especially using AI to help uh, instructors filter and read examples, it helps the experts to actually uh, create better rubrics and define this, this domain better. So I think this may be another uh, future work where we can use these examples as a way to help experts uh, better define these domains. Oh, that's great. Well, well, thank you again for your wonderful talk. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, next up, we have Professor Chad Jenkins. His talk is entitled Distributive Teaching Collaboratives for Addressing Systemic Disparities in Artificial Intelligence. Mm -hmm. Chad Jenkins is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan, and he is the leader of the Laboratory for Progress, Perceptive Robots and Grounded Reasoning Systems. His work and that of his collaborators aims to discover methods for computational reasoning and perception that will enable robots to effectively assist people in common human environments. Essentially, he explores how to make the real world programmable through the control of autonomous robots. Critical challenges towards this goal are enabling robots to perceive our world, reason under uncertainty, and learn from human users. This research pertains primarily to interactive robotics with contributions to the technology of robot, of robot perception and mobile manipulation towards enabling the usability of this technology by people in real situations. Uh, because science is exactly independently verifiable knowledge, uh, open source contributions and reproducibility are critical features of this work. So with that, thanks so much. And we look forward to hearing from Chad. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Emily. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I appreciate this opportunity. In fact, it's, uh, it's a huge privilege to be here at the University of Michigan and work with a fabulous uh, group of, 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 uh, of colleagues in AI and robotics. We're in a new robotics building, and so it's amazing. And, and you know, just, a, you know, this is, this is a, a great, um, this is just a, a wonderful environment. Um, and, you, and a lot of what we do, is, as, uh, as, my, as Emily just said, is uh, we, try to, we try to be able to um, 
to get robots to do things. And so in order for us to program robots by demonstration, they have to see. Um, and so I'm going to play this video again. Um, and so, you know, it's hard for robots to see because there's a lot of things that complicate our world, such as uh, transparent objects that uh, introduce specularity and distortion and missing depth information. Um, and that really, you know, and so if you want to just do simple things like, uh, like build a champagne tower, <laughs> this actually turns out to be very hard for robots to do. If they can see the world, then we can start to program from them from demonstration. And so, so these are the types of things that I, I really like to talk about. This is, this is my passion. How do we get robots to do things? How do we program them? How do we have them learn from demonstration? And I'd be happy to give a talk on, what, on, our, on our work in semantic robot programming. Um, but the reality is, is that there are bigger issues that we also need to address. And to me, uh, there are one of these came, some of this came home on, uh, on January 9th, uh, 2020. Um, and so this is uh, this was my 46th birthday, and so uh, so when I was here uh, celebrating with friends and, and family, um, not too far away from from here in Ann Arbor, uh, Robert Williams, who was in Farmington Hills, who was in Farmington Hills Hill at the time, uh, was wrongfully arrested uh, purely based off of a, a bad neural neural rec neural network recognition hit. Um, uh, basically, the uh, a robbery was committed in, in Detroit. Uh, they took grainy video and then they ran it through a neural network and then they said, all right, and, and uh, Robert Williams came up as the, as the suspect and they just went out and, uh, and arrested him. And uh, he spent 30 days in, in uh, I mean, 30 hours, not 30 days, 30 hours detained, uh, was, was arrested in front of his, his friends and his family. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and so this is really traumatic experience. And he's written a great uh, op-ed for, for the Washington Post that, that, that talks about this. Um, but as we know in, 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 for in, in civil rights, uh, as, as we're thinking about the ethics and the implications of what we do in, in artificial intelligence, that, um, that if, if, you, if this could happen, if whatever could happen to, uh, what, whatever rights can be infringed on one person could affect everybody. You can't have civil rights for anyone uh, without civil rights for everybody. And so if you take, if this is what could happen to, to Robert Williams, um, it could also happen to somebody like, let's say, President Obama, uh, where, they, where there was an experiment run uh, or, uh, over the summer, uh, or, or you know, a year ago, um, where they took grainy video of, of President Obama and ran it through a neural network to do a super resolution to blow it up into, into something that's a more crisp image. And, uh, and you definitely don't get President Obama back. <laughs> um, and, uh, and one explanation for this by, uh, by Turing Award winner and neural network pioneer Jan LeCun was that, well, you know, computation is not the problem, right? The, com the computer's just doing what you're told, but, but really it's just, you know, it's just the data. You just have, have you know, your, your data is not right. And from a technical perspective, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think what that, what that misses though is the systemic perspective. What it misses is that, um, is that, you know, well, what are we doing overall as a system in terms of the people we're training, the, what, the culture in the research labs? How do we get to this point that, that, that we're making the, these mistakes? Um, and, uh, and I think, I don't think my colleague, uh, Professor Lacoon understands that as much as he should. Um, we have failed systemically in artificial intelligence. I mean, and that's the way that we were, that I was the system I came up through, um, where we thought primarily about the technical work that we've done. We haven't thought about the implications and we haven't thought about the people that, uh, that come through and who are going to, who are going to be able to carry this out, um, to just sort of break this down, uh, essentially as, as when we're talking about, uh, about black people, when we're talking about the descendants of American slavery and segregation, what we're seeing uh, over what we've seen over the history of artificial intelligence is there have been few and marginalized black AI researchers who could work on these these types of problems. I took an image here from uh, from Viola Jones, which is the early facial neck recognition work. And to Viola Jones's credit, uh, they actually talk about these diversity issues in this paper in figure eight. And so I, I appreciate that, but that hasn't quite carried forward. The reality is, is that the people that are working in the research labs are also the ones who, who, uh, who are teaching in the classroom as well, and then helping generate the next, next um, the future uh, work, the, the future workforce, the leaders and the innovators and, um, and the developers who are going to, who are going to train these systems and deploy them out in society. And so we just have seen low production of black CS graduates. Um, in addition, the end use of this technology is a problem in that that you have unwise and uneducated use by this technology out in the world, such as by law enforcement in this case. There has been a number of, of work that has, has described these front end problems. And so when we think about algorithmic fairness, we talk about 
these front end issues. And so that's important, such as the gender shades work that's come out a few years ago. But I think the thing that we don't think about as much as the back end problem, what are we doing in the classrooms? What are we doing in the research labs that are gonna produce the workforce that's gonna, that's gonna lead to equitable outcomes. And I could make this all about, you know, about, you know, um, you know, diversity and, and, and black people, but I would make the argument that this is really an issue of our, our CS classroom climate, uh, that, you know, that one of the things that we really need to address for, for, the, for, the, for the future is that students can feel defeated by math. And we really need to do something about this because our, the way we're still teaching still has a 1990s mentality when it comes to, to computing and a 1960s mentality when it comes to math. And so, uh, and so we're starting to see this in terms of computer science and that, you know, I think we're starting, we're doing our best to, 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 um, to address the, the, the big demand that we're seeing for, for computer science, which is, uh, which, is large, which is a national problem, not just a Michigan uh, problem. Um, and this is, this is really dictated by, by salaries. And so if you look at the, the large numbers of enrollments that we see in, in computer science, um, which, is, which is huge, um, this is driven by by the salaries that one that one could get uh, coming getting out of getting computer computer science degree and coming out of college. Um, this is also you know we have we are trying to adapt our curriculum so that we can provide out, can we provide at, uh, opportunities to in, to engage robotics and AI so that it doesn't have to be something that, that you just see in your last year. It's something that you can you can have access to throughout your um, throughout your college experience. And you know, and just in terms of diversity, we've seen the impacts of this. If we looked at the, the, the um, I'm very proud of CSI for, for producing an annual diversity report. Um, what we can see for the for the over 2,500 majors that we have, you know, we've got uh, we've got you know very small numbers of, of black 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 people in, in the program. And this is you know this is there's a number of dimensions that are that are at issue in terms of uh, female representation, native representation, Hispanics. Um, first generation students, but this is, I think, is an indicator that should give us a lot of, lot of concern. And really, I think a lot of this is due to, we haven't updated our, our we're, we're trying to update our curriculum and that what we still have, even in, even in ECS right now, is still, uh, you know, a 1990s model of, you know, of, of what this, what, how we're structuring computing. And so what should this look like for, for 2020, uh, for this decade? And what we're trying to do is, um, is you know is in, in, in you know uh, here is we're trying to to introduce some ideas that could that could address these problems and and make make our academic environment better for everybody and so uh, so these are some ideas that that we've been we've been exploring in Michigan Robotics to to solve for equity as if you as described in this ASE Prism article um, the, the main idea at the end of the day is that coding is believing. Um, math makes sense when you put it into code, you put it into action, and you can see the result. And so, you know, so I would I would make that argument that if you're doing pencil and paper math exercises, it's like what if, what you know that works for somebody, but doesn't for some people doesn't work for everybody. I think coding coding math makes much more sense. And we're trying to do this in the context of defining the discipline of robotics through the lens of, of embodied intelligence. We're trying to come up with a number of of um, one first year classes, uh, introductory classes that give students access to how they can uh, how they can use artificial intelligence for sensing, reasoning, and acting. Um, and so these courses already exist. I'm teaching Robotics 102 right now, which is thinking about autonomous navigation as graphs and graph algorithms. Uh, but I think the the one that, that I think I'm, I'm very proud of uh, is, is uh, computational linear algebra. And so this is a course that we've been offering uh, with Morehouse College. Our good, our, this is a course that Jesse Grizzle, my colleague, in robotics has created. Um, he's done it with a du Professor Dwayne Joseph at, uh, at Morehouse. And the idea is that we wanna, if you take your linear algebra book, I've got mine right here from, uh, this is my linear algebra book from, from 1994. Um, if you take that book, you can divide it up and it, there's a computational part where you can talk about where it's algorithms, like decomposition algorithms, matrix operations, orthogonalization. And then there's the theory under, underneath it. There's the linear independence and spanning over any arbitrary space. But if we think about three dimensions and what we need to do in three dimensions, there's a number of interesting projects we could do for building out 3D maps geometrically, for being able to do regression over any type of data set and sovereign large linear systems, such as what we could use for balancing a robot on a little Segway platform. And so if we can, and so this is really to take math and then make it real in some form. And this doesn't have to just be for robotics. It could be for any area 
where you use linear algebra it could be for you know for chemistry or economics you know it's really trying to make it make a give it a purpose and then lead into inspired deeper math preparation because if we consider the typical math progression what it looks like um you know we go into high school and we have algebra one geometry algebra two and then we're then we basically are moved moved into the into a into the calculus track and then maybe at the at, you know at the at towards the end we can start to do linear algebra and then linear algebra builds us into art into interesting app interesting areas of artificial intelligence but that puts the fun stuff last and i think that defeats a lot of students uh and it has big effects on diversity um, instead, what we could do is if we take this more coding as believing approach, and this is just one possible instantiation is not the canonical, canonical form. We take linear algebra, break it up, and we have good first year, uh, first introductory experience using computational linear algebra, putting theoretical linear, linear, linear algebra maybe a little bit further back. Students could get earlier access to, to, to AI, and we could make it more, more accessible. And so this is why I think we can alleviate a number of, of pain points that we have in our current curriculum. If people are and if people are interested, well, we've uh, you know the, all the material for for robotics 101 for computational linear algebra is online. This is meant to be sort of uh, you know open source curriculum development that we're doing with Morehouse and other uh, other uh, other schools as well. And so this is meant to distribute the teaching. If we can distribute it, so like so uh, so somebody at a particular school doesn't have to ramp up the entire cl class all by themselves, um, then they could uh, that they could they could do this in a, in, a, in good form. Um, and so this is uh, this is what we're planning for solving for equity. And I just wanted to say one last thing. I'm not saying that we're we're counting calculus out. I'm all I'm saying is that we should lead with linear, and I think that will lead to good effects in our in our system. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for your great talk. Uh, so I'm going to actually combine two questions. Um, so. There's a question, uh, do you think upsampling the video would have made it any easier to recognize who is the, sub the suspect in the first example discussed? But I think there's sort of an interesting second question that, that links to it, which is talking about how does exposure to a research topic change students' ability to reflect on these types of issues, issues that relate to perhaps um, lack of information from a like signal processing information theoretic perspective? How does the ability to have this information early change uh, students' time and uh, processing for reflecting on these kind of larger societal inequity issues. Right. I, I think um, I, 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 I think these two things are, are, are very much related um, in that um, in that we when you're coming through the through the through the system right now, you're thinking about grades. How do I get my grade? How do I get my job? You're on the treadmill to you know to achieve professionally. And, um, and, and by the time you actually started to make something that's interesting, it doesn't just have to be um, artificial intelligence. It could be you know, making the security system, the OAuth system for, uh, for a website or for, for somebody's smart TV. Um, you, know, you may not, you know, you're just trying to get through the system, but then by the time you realize what, what's happened, it's, you know, it's too late. Um, and so this is really about thinking about the implications of the things that we develop. And one thing that we don't do in computer science, I think as much, and we're starting to get there, if we think about the test first and then the implementation, how do we how do we test in our systems? And I think, and I also believe that we could take things like software engineering and move that earlier because that's where we start to think about the use case of our systems. And so this is, uh, I think, ethics and fairness are just part of the overall con larger considerations. And you know, and I am not an expert in facial recognition, but I do know that I need to consider that literature. I need to consider those ideas as I'm developing the technology, but also as I'm training people on the technology as well. That's wonderful. And sort of thinking about that, so you, you highlighted the fact that there are a bunch of groups who are individually underrepresented. And I wonder what we can do to bring communities together to sort of support a more positive, welcoming environment. Uh, you know, I, I think the, to me, the biggest thing um, is that we need to have a better partnership with our in with our with our um, colleagues in industry, I believe that the career fair, more so than the classroom, is the thing that drives a lot of our climate, and probably some of the problematic issues that we have in our climate. Um, and so, you know, because because nowadays, I think if, if you don't have an internship by October for <laughs> for next summer, it can be it can be somewhat of a challenge. Um, and so, I think we have to we have to think about the entire process, and and therefore we need uh, more engagement with uh, with our um, 
with our, our colleagues in the industry and, and who, who, who provide the postgraduate experience. Um, speaking of, of more engagement, so do you think that there will be a major in robotics for undergraduate students? And what might this do for our ability to have, again, these topics brought to the forefront? Right, uh, well, I, I think um, I've made my case for the, for the major in robotics. Uh, it's really up to our good friends, our good faculty in the college uh, to, to deliver a great vote for us. Um, uh, but I believe if, assuming that we are, we are allowed to, to move forward, there will be a robotics major starting uh, fall 2020, to go online as far as fall 2020. And so this really is meant to be, to take a number of the, the interesting topics that you can learn at the graduate level and bring them into the second and third year undergraduate experience. Uh, we wanna make it such that you can be a roboticist with four years of education at Michigan instead of six years where you have to do a bachelor's plus a master's. And Love so, it. and I think it'll be a good compliment to, to all the great things that are happening in Michigan AI, which is, which is a, a privilege to be in such a leading and, uh, and thoughtful AI group. That's, that's just wonderful. Well, thank you again so much for your talk, sir. There are a few questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, but uh, thank you again to both Professor Zhuang and Chad Jenkins. And thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. Uh, please remember to attend the Birds of a Feather uh, conversation at 3.30. And next, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Jenna Weens and the Rising AI Stars talk session. So thanks again. Mm -hmm.